You're listening to Now I've Heard Everything, interviews from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s with voices from the past. When Leonard Maltin or Siskel and Liebert didn't like one of my movies, I took it as though they didn't like one of my children. Former Hollywood studio executive Don Steele. Today on Now I've Heard Everything, I'm Bill Thompson. So have you ever seen the movie Flashdance? Or how about Top Gun, the original Top Gun? Or Fatal Attraction? Those are just some of the many, many movies whose production was overseen by studio executive Dawn Steele. And in this case, her last name may have been very appropriate because a woman in the very male-dominated world of Hollywood filmmaking had to be made of steel. Although, as a side note, according to Wikipedia, her father had changed the name to Steele from the original Spielberg. So maybe it was destined she would wind up in the movie business? I don't know, but that's a different story. Her 1993 memoir was called They Can Kill You, But They Can't Eat You. And that's when I had a chance to meet her and talk with her. So here now from 1993, Dawn Steele. Why did you write this book? The truth of the matter is, I wish I could tell you it was my idea. It wasn't. A very smart editor at Pocket Books came to... I hope she's very smart. We'll see. (laughs) Came to me and she said, there's been no female version of Iacocca or Trump or, you know, how to succeed in business uh, and have a life from the feminine point of view. It's not a how to succeed in the movie business necessarily. I hope it's a how to succeed in business, any business. But it has to be fundamentally different, though, from those others because those are men succeeding in a man's world. Yes. I think that it is, I don't, whether it's fundamentally different or not, there are differences. I don't know, I, I don't think that there are, it's completely different, but there are certainly some differences. I think that men grow up in locker rooms, women don't. So they understand innately the, the theory of the team, the locker room syndrome, where you walk into a locker room and you're all part of the same goal. Women don't understand that. They have not had a chance to learn that. I was fortunate in that I was trained as a swimmer. So I was part of a team from a very young age. And maybe that's why these concepts came to me a little bit easier. And at that very young age, you said to yourself, I'd love to head a major motion picture studio someday. (laughs) I have to tell you, and this should give a lot of people some encouragement, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up until I got to be 35 or (laughs) 6. So I have to tell you, it was a, I, I had four or five other careers prior to going out to Hollywood. At what point did you, as you explain in far greater detail in the book than we have time to go into here now, how did you wind up from receptionist to, to head, of, head of the studio? You're right. You don't have to <laughs> But, you know. This is not how to succeed in business without really trying, is it? No. It's how to succeed in business trying really, really, really hard. You know, the thing was is that I had some other careers, and somebody suggested to me that if you could merchandise toilet paper, which was one of my um, earlier careers, or dubious distinctions, depending on how you look at it, um, you can merchandise the movie business. I thought, well, that made complete sense. So I went to Hollywood and got a job in merchandising, and I wound up in the middle of a kind of a mess called Star Trek, the movie. It was the first movie, and it was very very behind schedule and it was way over budget and I had to sell my job was to sell the merchandising rights to that movie meaning everything from toys to McDonald's hopefully you would have you know those kind of tie-ins to book publishing to pajamas it was my job and I didn't have a movie to show anybody so you know how difficult it is to try to convince a toy company to do uh, figures of Klingons and, and, and Mr. Spock without letting them see the movie, but there was no movie to show them. So I managed to do this show in the, in the small theater on the lot. I invited every merchandising manufacturer there was, and I did this show whereby first I got beamed onto the stage with, like, with lasers, and then I was smart enough to not stay up there by myself too long. And then we had Bill Shatner beamed down and Leonard Nimoy beamed down and the entire crew of the Starship Enterprise. And it was so theatrical that I managed to convince the people in the audience that there really was a Star Trek the movie because here were these people. They were standing right there. They must be making this movie. And fortunately for me, they did, and the movie finally got finished. And it was very successful. It was the first time um, a big-time merchandising campaign happened in the movie business. 
And r mainly because Star Wars had come before Star Trek, but there was no merchandising because no one knew in advance that Star Wars was going to be the hit it was. Uh, is there something about show business that bites you that once once you're into it because you could I'm sure there are people who just as enthusiastically can work up a presentation for toilet paper or rubber bands or uh, you know a new car or something but isn't there something magical about being in Hollywood well I think so you know I mean this is the thing when I first got there I have a terrible sense of direction and I kept getting lost and I finally wound up on the Paramount lot it was my first day in the job and I walk over to an information booth thinking that I could get pointed to where my office was and I walk up and I realize it's a facade it was a set and I knew I was in trouble I mean I knew from that moment on that I better realize that what I saw was not necessarily what I was gonna get and as I walked across the lot that day coming right at me from either sides of the lot was John Travolta and Warren Beatty and I thought, okay, I get it. I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> so I, I just want to say that I never for one minute took any of it for granted because it was never quite, I kept pinching myself thinking, how did I get here? You know, how did I get so lucky? Because I really believe a lot of it is luck, but most of it is real hard work. I did notice when I took the Universal Studios tour for the first time that nothing was real Nothing. that even the grass had been painted right. green yes, even yes. though it was in in mid January at a uh, Rose Bowl time or January 1st Rose Bowl time it was a nice lush green everywhere else in, in the greater Los Angeles area but they'd painted, they painted the grass it. green exactly right well i think that i need to point something out to you uh, there was a drought going on <laughs> at the time, oh, and everybody's I... <laughs> grass was painted green, but that's Los Angeles. You know? <laughs> you know, but but a, a large measure of your book, besides the perseverance theme yes, exactly. uh, that runs through it, is that you can't take a whole lot real seriously. Your, yourself, your your life, the, right. the studio, uh, it's just you, you have to remember what's really important to you and not take the extraneous stuff too seriously. You're exactly right, and I think that it is about, you know, you have to, everyone takes their job seriously. Seriously, or their career seriously but I think what I learned is don't take the rejection so personally and that was an amazingly important lesson for me and in fact when I first got the job as head of production at Paramount I had been in Hollywood for you know seven or eight years or more or less and I had the, it hadn't been announced to the quote trade papers yet and I was I had been invited to a fundraiser at Lou Wasserman's house. Lou Wasserman is probably the most important man in Hollywood, and he's kind of a legendary um, fellow, and he's chairman of Universal, and has been for a really long time. And I go to his house, and I'd never been to his house. I'd never been to anybody's house like that. And I walked in and looked around at the art on the walls, and I thought, I've never seen art like this except in museums. And, and then I walked around, and I realized that mostly men in the room and I realized that they were all so much higher up in the hierarchy than I was I knew who they were but they didn't know who I was so I walked around and I realized in about 10 minutes that I did not belong in this room that th I was completely uncomfortable had a shy attack and walked outside I was waiting for my for the valet to bring me my car when Bob Daly who's chairman of Warner Brothers walked out of the party and he comes right at me and his hand is out and I think he knows who I am he's gonna welcome me into the club. And he walks over and he puts his hand out and I think to shake my hand, so I put my hand out. He hands me his parking ticket and he <laughs> says it's a white Mercedes. <laughs> so when you start to take yourself too seriously, don't. <laughs> that was my lesson. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Why do you suppose that the, the, the perseverance theme kept coming at you from, from every, every time that, you, that, that things seemed to be going off kilter, you, you'd the, 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 the theme of perseverance, yes, English, English is my first language, <laughs> this theme of perseverance would come back at you. What was it trying to tell you? Well, I think that the whole notion of perseverance tells us all something, which is um, if you give up, there's no chance of getting what you want. I think it's really very basic. And, you know, I remember I used to feel like a bop bag. Do you know those things? You punch them down, they come right back up. <laughs> And it was the image that kept me going for a very long time, this, this clown that just kept coming back up. Because I think that anyone who's ever successful is successful because he or she has persevered and not given up. Look at President Clinton, who went through a really, really rough primary. He went, you know, that whole series of primaries, the beginning of the presidential, um, if you will, the 100 days and all the criticism he took. But he never gave up. 
he never gave up. He comes back and, as you saw last night, this extraordinary speech. How do you know, though, if you're persevering in the right direction? Well, this is what I, I believe very strongly, that if you have a point of view, if you have a vision, if you have a passion for something that you really want, if you can see it in your head, and I talk about this in the book, mm -hmm. this notion of visualization that if you can see it in your head, you can have it. And it is the beginning of goal setting in some very profound way, at least for me. And that when I realized I wanted to be head of production at Paramount, I was able to see myself in that job doing the job. So I think that perseverance is a physical thing and it's a mental thing as well. Because you begin to act like it already is your You're job. You're exactly right. You act like it already is your job and other people will believe it. And so much about it is how you see yourself. And it's one of those things that I, I tell women so often, you know, when, some, when, when we, you start to talk about feminism and this whole notion of women as victims. And I believe really strongly is that if you see yourself as a victim, other people will see you as a victim too. That goes for women, that goes for minorities, it goes for anyone who sees themselves, see themselves as a victim. Let me ask you a little bit more about the, the movie business itself as, as you experienced it. Was it all business from your point of view? Is there, was there no art involved as well? Well, it's the primary reason, by the way, why I am now a producer, because I finally felt that you know, the place for me was on the creative side, and it was much more fulfilling and interesting for me. But which is not to say that as a studio executive, which is primarily the business side, that I didn't try to bring some um, artistic um, passion into the job. And in fact, many of the movies I made were movies I made from my heart. And I felt as attached to them as the filmmakers felt. Would Flashdance have gotten made without you? No. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think so. I think that... Um, at the expense of sounding arrogant, um, I couldn't. Nobody would read the script in my studio. I couldn't get anybody to read the script. Nobody could get anybody to read the script, and it had been around for a while and had floundered at another studio and was not getting made. And it had been slipped to me by a young agent, and she said to me, "You have to read this script in your car in front of my mother's house, and then give it back to me after you read it." Now I had just gotten into film production, and I thought, well. It must be the way that they read scripts in this business. It sounded really pretty weird to me, but I thought, okay, I'm game. So I read this script in my car, and I realized that I just felt, I just completely fell in love with it. I was able to see the movie and identify with this girl. Now, I know you think this sounds really weird to identify with a young woman who was a welder who wanted to be a ballet dancer. In retrospect, it sounds very strange, but... I was a very strange girl at the time. And I finally was able to convince Paramount to at least read it. But in order to convince them to read it, and again, this is about perseverance, I had to quit my job. I was having a really tough time having, um, getting them to read the script. It had gone on for months and months and months. This was after this whole thing in my car. And I went downstairs to see one of my mentors. And he said to me, you can't get them to pay any attention to you, can you? And I said, no, I can't. I can't get them to read the script. I know this script is a hit movie. And he said, hmm, quit your job. I said, what do you mean quit your job? What do you mean? I could barely, I was stuttered through this. What do you mean quit my job? I got to pay my rent. He says, quit your job. It's pretty bad now, isn't it? I said, yes. He said, is it going to get any different? If it, is it going to change? I said, I don't think so. He says, well, you better do something to get their attention. So I went marching upstairs and I thought, I stood outside my boss's door and I thought, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm doing this. And I kept hearing my mentor's voice saying, no risk, no gain, no risk, no gain. And uh, I walked into my boss's office and I said, if you don't want to make this movie, if you don't even want to read this script, then you'll never want to do anything I ever want to do. So you might as well let me go right now. And I'm not saying he made the movie because I quit, but it certainly did make him pay attention to me. And he read the script and then he agreed with me. So I think one of the great anecdotes in the book for me was finding out that not only was Babe Ruth the home run champ, but he was the strikeout champ too. <laughs> so I rest my case, no risk, no gain. <laughs> Does it sting, I mean, you talk in the book about the, 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 
uh, the vicious things are said about you in the press, right. uh, the, the names you were called, the, the, the characterizations. Does it sting, though, equally when you make a movie that means a lot to you, that you poured, put a lot into yes. this, and Siskel and Ebert hate it, and Leonard Malton hates it, right. and Entertainment Tonight trashes it, and the, all the papers say it's, it. That's got to hurt, too. Well, it's, let me just tell you, this is what I don't think the press ever really understands, or maybe people reading it may not understand either. It's all very painful, and this is the part, you know, where you say to yourself, don't take it personally, but it is personal. And let me just say to you, very, you know, this whole criticism, sometimes women, powerful women or tough business women are looked at under a different microscope than men and the rules are different for them and I think that women are just going to have to swallow it for a moment until it gets better and and try in some really profound way not to take it personal and you know I'm not saying that I was not a tough boss I was I had a job to do and I was and am a perfectionist and I needed people working for me who were committed and passionate and good at what they did but in answer to your second question, which is in some ways more important to me, I took it all incredibly personally. When, when Leonard Malton or Siskel and Liebert didn't like one of my movies, I took it as though they didn't like one of my children. And I, you know, you put in so much work and so much passion and you believe in something so much and then it gets out there on the screen and, you know, a critic doesn't like it. Um, it's, it's painful. Uh, fortunately for me that a lot of the movies that I made, the audiences really uh, liked, but critics didn't. I wish I had both, and, and maybe Cool Runnings, which is the movie we're releasing October 1st about the Jamaican bobsled team, uh, maybe that'll get have both. I keep trying, you know, again, perseverance. Yeah, you know, I saw your name on the, on the, on the TV commercial the other yeah. night, and then my kids were most impressed when Good. I told them that you were coming in. Oh, <laughs> make sure they see this movie. It looks terrific. If, you know, how old are your kids? Uh, 11 and 13. Perf boys, girls? Uh, girls. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> they'll love it. I promise you they'll love it. It's a real family movie, and it's, it's, a, it's about perseverance. It's about four young guys from Jamaica who had never seen snow who got to the Olympics as bobsledders. And it's funny, and it's warm, and I guess I'm attracted to movies about perseverance. <laughs> I think that the most important lesson of the book, it, for me, is uh, if I can do this, anyone can do this. I started off with a parents you know, who were in very big financial trouble. My father got very ill. I didn't have a college education. I didn't know anybody when I went to Los Angeles. And I got to where I got to from perseverance and, and being able to see my dreams in front of me. Dawn Steele succumbed to brain cancer just three years after our interview in 1997 at age 51. Now, you can get a copy of They Can Kill You But They Can't Eat You by Dawn Steele by clicking on the link in our show notes or by going to our website, HeardEverything.com. Oh, and HeardEverything.com is where you'll also hear my 1994 interview with famed film producer Robert Evans. I, I made people cry. I made people laugh. I made people fall in love. I have evoked emotions that no one else could do. I'm an image maker and an emotion maker, and maybe I'm a little crazy, you know? because to accomplish what I do, you can't do it normally. And my 2004 conversation with Peter Bogdanovich. The chase was 12 minutes. We took four weeks to shoot it. Even when they jumped into, when, they, when the cars went into the bay at the end of that <laughs> sequence, uh, that was real. In fact, we didn't even cheat. We didn't even undercrank it. We didn't speed it up. We actually shot it. They were going 70 miles an hour. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, that was quite something. <laughs> And don't forget, of course, that we post new episodes of Now I've Heard Everything every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you know where you can find us, every major podcast platform. And thank you so much for listening. Next time on Now I've Heard Everything, there's a reason that even economists call economics the dismal science. But in the hands of somebody like satirist P.J. O'Rourke, it takes on a whole new resonance. So my 1998 interview with P.J. O'Rourke. Economics tells you how things happen, and it tells you why things happen. But all we really care about in our personal lives is what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And economics is as useless as a Ouija board on those subjects. That's next time on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson. Thompson.